forks apparently you know found just about to light the fuse and someone Very convenient. died mm -hmm. of poison in the tower what i'm suggesting i think that here is a, a is a classic a great opportunity for radio new zealand um to commission a special probe um of the gunpowder plot <laughs> and to send a hand-picked team over uh, there with the increased uh, funding that the new government's going to... Are you volunteering, here. Jock? I well, think both he is go. volunteering. Why don't we all go? Have Especially considering Guy Fawkes is obviously, you know, in, there's such still such intense interest not in Guy Fawkes Day. And also the other thing pointed out in the cold case is how did they move the 36 barrels yes. from that from their house yes. to the cellars of the Houses of Parliament? Yeah. Very good. I want to ask you a couple of other things before we go. I know this is a hardy perennial, uh, the rights of students to express themselves. Students angry about makeup ban at Auckland's Rangitoto College. It's not exactly clear what is allowed at Rangitoto College, but I mean, young women who wear makeup to hide acne, for example, are possibly exempt. But the question has arisen in this case as to whether staff can hand out wet wipes and make girls take makeup off. So the question, uh, you first, Stephanie, I guess, mm. makeup at a co ed secondary school is it the school's right to decide? What do you think? I personally completely disagree with this. I disagree with most of these kinds of uniform rules. I think the enforcement creates far more disruption than the wearing of makeup or the dyeing mm. of hair. I remember a girl in my class at high school was um, stood down for several days because her hair was deemed an unnatural shade of red, um, which made a complete mockery of it. You could dye your hair black because that was a natural shade but not bright red. <laughs> that was what caused the fuss. No one cared what colour her hair was. And I think... For young adults, uh, they're going through such a process of figuring out who they are, their place in the world. Personal appearance is so important as a part of identity. Um, I think it's simply the ethical thing to do to allow them in, in the safe environment of a school to start expressing themselves and figuring out who they are in the world. All right, before I ask Jock, is there a line to be drawn, uh, pardon the pun, regarding eyeliner, mascara and how far you go? Well, I think it's... An incredibly subjective line because there are people who have incredibly dark thick natural lashes who look like they're wearing eyeliner much of the time how do you tell how do you possibly start to police that without some degrading exercise of lining every student up at the beginning of the day and getting them to scrub at their face to see who's wearing makeup and who just has naturally flawless skin that would them. be an interesting ritual to observe jock what's your position on this yeah, I, I tend to agree, um, as provided the same um, rules and regulations apply to young men who wear makeup. I mean, this is very similar to the haircut case that ended up in the High Court from memory, yeah. uh, the length of hair. And it, still, it smacks of um, the, the good old days uh, of gym frocks um, when girls had to uh, line up and the gym frock was measured um, by a, um, usually an elderly um, female uh, a senior mistress. Senior mistress, probably unmarried at the time, and was measured. Uh, yeah, you can you can go overboard overboard with this sort of thing, and I think everything within reason. Okay, but the, the, the Luke and Batterson case, the, the the judge did say yeah. a school has to reflect the values of the community. So I that is the other fair. side of that. That's fair. Yeah. All right. We don't have time to talk about it more, but we certainly got through quite a lot this afternoon. Stephanie Rogers, thank you for your company today. Thank you for having me. Come back again. Jock Absolutely. Anderson. Uh, safe drive home, Jock. Thanks for being on. It's a on. pleasure. All the best, Stephanie. Thank you for your company, everybody. Uh, have a lovely weekend uh, if you're not working. And Checkpoint with John Campbell is coming right up. Kia ora everyone, tonight Auckland Council says it's considering prosecuting the owner of one of the city's busiest buildings after Checkpoint revealed last night it has not had a valid warrant of fitness for over 400 days. Morocco Thai's mother speaks for the first time since her son was killed in a police pursuit. The chair of the embattled Waikato DHB refuses to resign over excessive spending by former CEO Nigel Murray. A report into the devastating Port Hills fires in February reveals failures in cooperation, coordination and command. And Māori wardens on the streets in South Auckland as uh, Tongan and Samoan Rugby League supporters prepare for the big game over the weekend.
RNZ News at 5 o'clock. No, my Heidi, my good afternoon. I'm Paul Brennan. Māori wardens are expecting more trouble in Otara tonight as tension builds before tomorrow night's Rugby League World Cup game between Tonga and Samoa in Hamilton. The Otara Town Centre says it's confiscated more than a dozen weapons from young Tongan and Samoan supporters. Tom Furley reports. Six people were arrested last night after 200 Samoan and Tongan League supporters clashed in car parks around the Ōtara shops. Businesses say customers are scared and they're considering closing early tonight. The town centre administrator, David Vainui, says school-aged fans have been using flags from a local $2 shop to conceal wood for weapons and he's had to confiscate and destroy 15 in the last week. The police are expected to have a strong presence in the area again tonight. This is Tom Furley. The Auckland Council is considering prosecuting the owner of a major Auckland multiplex for not having a building warrant of fitness. Sky World on Altea Square is home to event cinemas and dozens of food, retail and commercial tenants. It was issued with a dangerous building notice last December. The Council's building control manager Ian McCormick says it is no longer classed as dangerous, but its owners have not done enough to earn it a warrant of fitness. He says they have just missed an October deadline to comply and have not been easy to deal with. Fairly disengaged, I think unresponsive would probably be good words for it. It would be fair to say it's, uh, it's frustrating. There is... Ian McCormick there of the Auckland Council. The head of the Waikato District Health Board, Bob, Sim Bob Simcock, says he will not be resigning over spending at the DHB. The new Health Minister, David Clark, has called for a State Services Commission investigation into the circumstances surrounding allegations of wrongful spending by the former Chief Executive, Nigel Murray. Dr Murray spent $218,000 on expenses during his three years in the job. Mr Simcock says he welcomes the investigation but sees no reason for his own resignation. There is uh, nothing in the recruitment process, there is nothing in our investigatory process and there is nothing that I believe that I've done um, over the last couple of years that uh, would justify that. Bob Simcock. The State Services Commissioner says a qualified investigator will be appointed to do the investigation. The new government will reconsider a flagship educational scheme introduced by the previous government. The Communities of Learning Scheme for Schools was part of the national-led government's Investing in Educational Successes initiative launched in 2014. The Education Minister Chris Hipkins says he agrees with the goal of encouraging cooperation among education providers, but changes are needed. The answers that the government have implemented with communities of learning aren't always the right answers. So the communities of learning model is very rigid. A lot of money is tied up in salaries rather than professional development and so on, and so we're going to have another look at that. Chris Hipkins says a reduction in the amounts paid to lead teachers is possible, but no decisions have been made. The Governor of Manus Province says Australia is leaving Papua New Guinea officials in the dark about its intentions for refugees and asylum seekers stuck in the island's detention centre. Charlie Benjamin says he has humanitarian concerns for the detainees since Australian staff pulled out of the centre on Tuesday. Food, water and power services have been cut, but about 600 detainees are refusing to move to temporary facilities in the island's main town. Mr Benjamin says he and immigration officials make little headway when raising their concerns with Canberra. The governments of Australia and Papua New Guinea each claim the other is responsible for relocating the men until a permanent solution is found. The Transport Agency has confirmed that State Highway 1 north of Kaikoura will be reopen or reopen on December the 15th. It's been closed since last November's earthquake, forcing motorists travelling between Picton and Christchurch to take an inland route that adds about three hours to the trip. The agency's earthquake manager, Tim Crow, says that once the road is open again, several sites will still be under construction and there will be some unsealed surfaces, lane closures and stop-go traffic controls. Parts of it will also be closed at night for several months as a safety precaution. It's just after five past five. On to sport now, and the All Blacks coach Steve Hansen says Sunday's clash with the Barbarians at Twickenham isn't a trial for dumped wing Julian Savia. Savia hasn't played for the All Blacks since the British and Irish Lions series in June, but was in strong form for Wellington in the recent provincial championship. Hansen insisted the 54-test veteran who scored 46 test tries has nothing to prove to him and still has a future in the black jersey. I don't think it's a trial match for Julian. Julian's on, we've got a, a plan for Julian and uh, it's about getting him enjoying his rugby and 
getting in a good headspace about that and he's been a very, very good test player. We've just given him a bit of a break away from the environment. Hopefully that break will get him excited and get him enjoying playing the game. Steve Hansen there. The NRL and its players have finally reached an agreement on pay, putting an end to more than 16 months of negotiation. Under the settlement, the players will reap a 52% rise, the biggest in the game's 109-year history. Australian driver Cameron Waters has finished fastest on practice day before the Auckland Super Sprint at Pukekohe this weekend. Supercars Championship leader Jamie Wincup was second fastest, while Scott McLaughlin's fourth was the best of the New Zealand contingent. And New Zealand Rugby Sevens player Sarah Goss and rower Robbie Manson have won the Female and Male Oceania Athlete of the Year awards at the National Olympic Committee ceremony in Prague. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Country Life meets Danny Almeida, who likes sheep so much she moved all the way to New Zealand from Brazil to be around them. Even the dead ones. The team also samples a bit of fine wine from Britain. That's not too much of an oxymoron for you. We have a mixtape from Delaney Davidson, and given we are just a couple of days out from Guy Fawkes, there's a sonic tonic dedicated to plotting. On Nights, heading out with a bang. After the news at 7 on RNZ National. We're funded through New Zealand on air. Now the short forecast taking, uh, taking us through to uh, midnight tomorrow, Saturday. Northland to Waitomo. That includes Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and Topol. Rain spreads east about now and into the evening with localised heavy falls. Taranaki and Tamaranui down to Kapiti. That includes Taihapi, mostly cloudy, occasional rain or showers. Gisborne to Wellington. Gisborne to Wairarapa, also Wellington. Cloudy periods, a few showers, mainly about the ranges. Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury. Showers retreating to the Alps and western ranges about now and becoming fine elsewhere. Buller to Fiordland. Periods of rain, heavy at times. Otago and Southland, scattered showers. Isolated thunderstorms are possible around now, about now this afternoon, and for the Chatham Islands, fine spells for the rest of today, mostly cloudy tomorrow with occasional drizzle. It is eight minutes past five. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, and welcome everyone to Checkpoint. We're going to begin highly unusually tonight with some breaking news. In fact, it's so breaking, Zach Fleming, who is sitting beside me in the studio. Welcome. Uh, that I only know that it concerns the Destiny Church and some forms they were meant to have filed by this evening. Is that right? Yeah, Destiny Church had until 5pm today to file two financial returns, two years of financial returns for two of its biggest charities. They're the Destiny International Trust and Tahahi o Nga Matamua Holdings. If they didn't file those by 5pm, they were going to be deregistered, or they had the other option of filing an objection to that deregistration. So I just want to clarify, 5pm, which is eight minutes ago, yes. was the deadline. Yes, and just before the deadline, they filed an objection to that deregistration. We checked uh, at quarter past four, and the Department of Internal Affairs hadn't heard anything at that point. So they've just filed an objection. Uh, so the Department of Internal Affairs says the matter will now be referred to its Independent Charities Registration Board, who will make a decision on that objection. Right, so they haven't filed their financial returns, no. but they have filed an objection to deregistration for not filing their financial returns. That's correct, yes. Okay. So it was the 2016 and 2017 financial returns that were due. Which they are required to file as a charity, a registered charity. They are. What sort of information is in these returns as a general rule, Zach? Um, the rules changed quite recently, so it's quite detailed now. Charities have to file financial returns quite similar to big businesses. Right. So it's things about um, how much key staff are paid, what you're spending money on, very, very detailed, down to even how much you spent on stationery for the last year, um, what assets you have and how money may, might have been moved around between Destiny Church's charities. And when it's filed, this becomes a matter of public record? So people... It does. Okay. Anyone can access it. So in the context the kind of work you've been doing uh, on where Destiny Church gets its money from and how they spend it, this would be information people would be interested in. Yes, and Destiny Church uh, gave us a written notif notification that they would file these returns by 5pm today, so they've, they've failed that. I tried to call Anne Williamson, Destiny Church's media manager, uh, a couple of minutes ago, and she didn't answer my call. She didn't pick up. Zach Fleming, with the very definition of breaking news, thank you very much indeed, Zach. We really appreciate it. We're going now to talk to, uh, turn to another Zach story. This is the Auckland Council, which says it's considering prosecuting a business owner after checkpoint. An investigation by Zach last night revealed his building has not had a warrant of fitness for 436 days. 
James Quack owns the Skywell building on Auckland's Queen Street, bang in the heart of the city. Today, Auckland Council confirmed Mr Quack had been frustrating to deal with and had missed an October deadline to meet compliance. Compliance is the issue here. Zach Fleming's story begins with Auckland Council's General Manager of Building Consents, Ian McCormick. Clearly disengaged, I think unresponsive would probably be good words for it. This is the only building that I'm aware where we've had at the in recent times so we've had this sort of level of um, well, lack of responsiveness, I suppose, from a, from a building owner. Straight from the horse's mouth, Auckland Council says James Quack is the city's least responsive building owner. The council held a press conference this afternoon about his Skyworld building after Checkpoint revealed last night it hasn't had a warrant of fitness for 436 days. We are going through the information we've currently got uh, and once we understand what the current state is we will take uh, appropriate action. Yesterday appropriate action was working with James Quack to get his building compliant. Today the council's changed its position, revealing the deadline it set James Quack was actually the end of October, which he's missed. So now prosecution is on the table. We're also talking to our legal team uh, in relation to what action we're going to take about their failure to um, provide us and issue us with a building warrant of fitness. Skyworld is one of the busiest buildings in Auckland, with 12 cinemas, a food court, games arcade, bowling alley and mini golf, more than 2 million people visit each year. The fire safety issues there date all the way back to 2014. At one point it was so dangerous the council demanded human smoke detectors stand guard in the food court and movie theatres. But despite that, James Quack was never prosecuted or fined. Penny Pirrett, the council's director of regulatory services, says often fines and punishments are not harsh enough. Uh, it's generally a fine of around $500 that is given to the owner of the building um, if they are indeed prosecuted. Quite often they are discharged without conviction. Checkpoint has spent the past month trying to contact James Quack to ask him why he has consistently failed to make his building safe. We visited his home and office as well as trying via phone and email. He was unresponsive with us too. He and his staff never replied to our emails, visits or phone calls. On one occasion though, we saw James Quack himself leaving his office. We'd never met him before, so we didn't know what he looked like, but I asked the man if his name was James. Why you ask me? I'm Zach Fleming from Radio New Zealand, is I, it? I have James. Hello? No? No? I'm just in a visiting there. I later showed two of James Quack's former employees that footage. They both confirmed it was James Quack. It's not known why he said his name wasn't James and that he was just visiting. Mr McCormick says Skyworld is currently safe, despite its lack of a warrant. Though he doesn't know what the issues are preventing it from getting one. I am uncertain at this point. Auckland Council says it will know very, very soon whether or not James Quack will be prosecuted for his warrant of fitness being 436 days overdue. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. And we'd love James Quack or anyone mandated to speak on his behalf to join us on Checkpoint tonight. The programme is on until half past six. The chair of the embattled Waikato District Health Board is refusing to resign over excessive spending under his watch. Details released by the DHB today show the former chief executive, Nigel Murray, racked up $218,000 in expenses over three years. That's led to the new health minister, David Clark, directing the State Services Commission to investigate the circumstances surrounding Surrounding Dr. Murray's misspending. Our health correspondent, Karen Brown, reports. Dr. Nigel Murray, who was on an annual salary of about $560,000, resigned last month amid concern over his expenses. The details released today show he spent a total of $218,000 over the three years he worked for the DHB since mid-2014. In the latest financial year, he had expenses of $91,500. The year before that, he spent $45,700 and $80,900 the year before that a figure that included relocation costs from Canada of $50,000. The Waikato DHB board chair Bob Simcock agrees it's too much. Quite clearly those figures are excessive um, and that's why we've been having the investigation. It's important to remember those figures include uh, amounts that uh, we are seeking repayment of. 
He says Dr Murray has repaid $30,000 and is still to reimburse the DHB for up to $50,000 more. But Bob Simcock says the out-of-control spending, including $2,000 on taxi fares last year, isn't his fault. You know, I don't see there is every invoice that comes into the organisation. I see the applications that are put in front of me for authorisation and uh, I authorise things that I believe to be appropriate. The controversy led the new Health Minister, David Clark, to announce he's directed the State Services Commissioner to launch an investigation into the circumstances surrounding allegations of wrongful spending by Dr Murray. Dr Clark would not be interviewed, but added in a statement that Dr Murray's resignation occurred partway through an independent inquiry that was not completed. I have written to Commissioner Peter Hughes today to request this action because such issues or allegations, especially relating to senior leaders in the public sector, risk damaging confidence in the public sector. Bob Simcock says he welcomes the Minister's step. I think the clearer that is, the sooner that he can have confidence in what has occurred here, other than obviously Dr, Mar uh, Dr. Murray's behaviour, uh, the happier we will be as well. But Mr Simcock says it's not an indication he's at fault and he won't be resigning. There is uh, nothing in the recruitment process, there is nothing in our investigatory process and there is nothing that I believe that I've done um, over the last couple of years that uh, would justify that. The head of the Junior Doctors' Union, Deborah Powell, disagrees. I believe Bob does need to resign. I don't believe that his ongoing functioning in that role is going to be tenable, given what has happened. There will always be doubts. And, you know, with the failure to get public clarity over what has happened here, there's, there's going to be a cloud hanging over him. Hilary Graham-Smith from the Nurses' Organisation says nurses and midwives will be outraged at the spending at a time of belt tightening across all DHBs. That's money that could have been spent in the health system. How many, how many hits could it have purchased? How many extra nurses and midwives could it have provided to the DHB, more importantly? The Waikato DHB has refused to release the investigation it called for into Dr Murray's spending, saying it's a draft, does not take his views into account and would encroach on his privacy. Mo te hotaka o te ahi ahi, ko Karen Brown tēnei. The mother of a 15-year-old who died in a crash during a police pursuit in Auckland three weeks ago says police shouldn't have chased him in Auckland traffic. Joanne Stevens' son, Morocco Tai, was driving a stolen car in Otara on the morning of October 9th. Already well known to police, a pursuit began that ended with the car he was driving hitting the curb, then crashing into a tree. He died at the scene. Following a series of high-profile police pursuits, including two deaths during another pursuit in Auckland a fortnight later, incoming Police Minister Stuart Nash says he wants to discuss the issue of pursuits with police to ensure the balancing act between effective policing and public safety is being achieved. Morocco Tai's mother, who acknowledges her son had gone off the rails and was driving a stolen car, said pursuing him in Auckland traffic when he was inevitably going to respond by driving dangerously fast was almost certainly going to lead to an accident. Since his death, the family have received sustained abuse on social media. Joanne Stevens spoke to me earlier today. Um, I'm struggling. Yeah, well, you lost your boy, right? Yeah. And what do you want to say about the circumstances in which you lost him? Um, I think it's all to do with uh, the police chase. Um, I mean, I've read that it was 58 seconds of, of pursuit. Um, at that time of the morning, people are going to work. Um, they should have pulled off. Whether it's 10 seconds, 15 seconds, they should have pulled off because the adrenaline for a 15-year-old would have been pumping and he would have put his foot down. And he did. And he did. Joanne's son, Morocco, was 15. He shouldn't even have been driving, and the car he was driving was stolen. Three weeks earlier, he'd been a passenger in another stolen car, travelling the wrong way along the southern motorway, not legally old enough to drive, to vote, to drink, to have sex or to leave school. He'd found a terrible recklessness. I think so. I just don't know what made him go down that road. There are two stories here, connected. Morocco Tai, who at 15 drove stolen cars like life didn't matter, and the most appropriate police response when kids like Morocco do that. The police certainly 
don't want to end up in a situation where actions that they have taken have caused the death of a young man or a young woman or anyone. Stuart Nash, the incoming police minister. Now, before we consider the police chase, let's consider the people they're chasing. If people didn't steal cars and didn't flee from the police, then we wouldn't be in this situation. But the bottom line is, they do. Yes, in an ideal world, 15-year-olds wouldn't steal cars and drive them in a way that endangered their own lives and the lives of anyone near them on the road. But to pick up where Stuart Nash left off, the reality is... They do. Now, there are, two, there are two responses to this. First of all, we can say to the police, OK, you are not to pursue any fleeing driver whatsoever. Or the second course of action is to say to the police, use your discretion if after a certain period of time, i.e. two or three or five seconds, it looks like this is going to end really badly or it has the potential to end really badly, then pull back. This is a discussion the new minister is going to have with police, but his sense is that cautious discretion is the best response to a really difficult situation. I actually think that's the right approach. Um, and it, but it is saying to you know the men and women in the police force, police service, hey, you know, do be careful, do exercise your discretion. Uh, we don't want to end up with fatalities. Um, but I think if we said to them, hey, there is now a policy of you must not chase any fleeing driver, then, you know, then, then that would have a counterproductive result. And I think if we said that, then any young person who is in trouble with the police, whether it's just a licensing problem, let alone a stolen car or anything, would just say, well, we now know the police will not chase us. All we need to do is put the foot down and we're away scot-free. Was it a way of being noticed, a way of being someone, all that stuff? I think so. Joanne, Morocco's mum, who must now deal with the death of her son and the public opprobrium, which has been constant since his death. I just want people just to, to, to leave my family alone and stop putting negative remarks, you know, all over social media. Some of it has been hateful. I read a comment um, saying that, um, good job, he deserves where he is and all this bullshit. That's a 15-year-old boy they're talking about? Yep. Your son? Yes. But there are difficult truths here. Boys like Morocco, 15 and no apparent sense of having much to live for, are far more common than those of us who might never meet them could possibly imagine. For people for whom juvenile delinquency might have run to a spot of pinching fruit from the neighbours' trees, Josh wants you to know, and please forgive the language, that there are lots of kids for whom life is shit. Exactly. It's shit, but it is the way of life around here, are we? Are there lots of kids your age who've lived through that stuff? Do you know lots of boys? Heaps. There's thousands. There's thousands of us. I met Josh in Otara on the 10th of October, not far from where Morocco Tai died. He's 17, a dad now, has a job, dreams, real dreams. But five years ago, he too was Morocco Tai, only younger. Uh, 12, 13, stealing cars, doing everything. Stealing cars at 12 or 13? Uh, yeah, robbing shops, you name it, I've done it, eh? Crashing cars through walls, everything. Tell me about him. What was he like? Oh, he was a bubbly child. Very happy. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was just a lovely child. Morocco Tai's mum would say that, of course. But then Joanne and Morocco's dad split. Joanne went back to Gisborne. Morocco stayed in Auckland with his dad. And he found the kind of new family kids find when you're a bit down on your luck and things are going a little awry. Um, I think he just just got on the wrong side of, you know, the other side of life and ended up with wrong people. And then things started going more and more wrong. School? Um, I think he got expelled from school when he was living with Dad. Days free. A vacuum, the only people to hang with also not in school. And so 
he, he's living with his dad. He's not seeing his mum very much. He's expelled from school, so he goes looking for a family to belong to, right? And the family that he looks to belong to is, you know, gang members and people who are doing crime, right? And so That's right. Josh remembered that. No money, they stole it or stole stuff to sell. When you're young, have no prospects and are poor, money is a defining statement. If you made money, then you have cracked it, pretty much. And how were you making money? Everywhere possible. Tell me, what were you doing? Anything, sir. Anything. Anything and anything. That's the truth. At 12 or 13? Yeah. And then came the cars. Josh, Morocco, they both stole cars, both drove them like nothing mattered. And, as Stuart Nash knows from police, there was something else going on too. And what the police tell me is that, in fact, you know, this is about notoriety. So, you know, it's almost a badge of honour. You steal a car, the police chase after you. You know, I'm a man now. You know, I've, 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 I've made the grade. The police are after me. They were after Morocco Thai on October 9th. He had two 16-year-old females with him. The police chase lasted 52 seconds. So many regrets. So many what-ifs. His mother. Wishing that he was still here with me. Josh and his sense of a lost generation. There's thousands. There's thousands of us. Sally Paya, the youth worker I spoke to the day I met Josh. It's because of that emptiness inside. That anger causes you to be angry about the world, angry about family, angry about everything. Angry of being poor, poverty. Angry of failures. And it puts you in a position where there's no hope. And the incoming police minister who wonders if the harder question we have to answer is not how we stop these kids once they've stolen the cars and are driving them so dangerously they might die. But a long, long time before then. What we've actually got to do, mate, is look a little deeper. You know, why are kids in a situation where they're stealing cars? I mean, I don't mean to sound idealistic or or glib or whatever, but, you know, as you said, when you and I were growing up, you'd steal apples over the fence from old Farmer Joe. You didn't go stealing cars. You know, so let, let's look at the problem a little bit deeper and say, OK, at what point can we intercede in these uh, young men and young women's lives where, you know, is it happening? Are they falling out of the system at school? Are they falling out of the system at home? Where, you know, what has led them down the path? where the opportunity for fun, for joy, to get your thrills is stealing a car as opposed to, you know, scoring a try on a rugby field. And again, I don't mean to sound glib or, or out of touch with the communities, but we do need to look at the underlying problem here. Stuart Nash, the incoming Minister of Police. 27 minutes past five. A Christchurch resident who lost his home in the February Port Hills fires says it's been incredibly hard to learn that homes may have been saved if fire and emergency services had done things differently. Two separate fires, several kilometres apart, started on February the 13th. The first on Early Valley Road and the second on Marley's Hill. Today, Fire and Emergency released an independent review of emergency services response, which found there had been shortcomings. Maya Burry reports. Helicopter pilot Steve Askin died fighting the fires, which merged into one large blaze that destroyed nine homes and forced thousands of people to evacuate their properties. Vicky and Doug Flaum lived on Worsley's Road for 25 years, but their home was reduced to ruins in February's fire. More than eight months on, their empty section, a reminder of the devastation caused by one of the biggest and most complex blazes in New Zealand's history. Ms Flaum says emotionally the event had taken a toll. Just that, not being able to go home. That, and nothing really feels like home anymore, even though we've got a home here and now, and it's full of furniture and that, but it's, everything's still unfamiliar. It's not what we've had around us for the past 25 years, you know, and you've accumulated over time. Today, Fire and Emergency released an independent review by Alan Goodwin from the Australasia Fire and Emergency Authorities Council looking at how emergency services responded to the blaze. It found that while firefighters from across the agencies did a lot of things well, there are areas that need to improve. Fire and Emergency's Chief Executive, Rhys Jones, says the review identified communication breakdowns with affected Port Hills residents and a lack of cohesion between the urban and rural fire authority who were fighting the fire together. It also noted agencies were working under different plans, command and control structures 
and communication with the public was lacking. In the cold light of, uh, of hindsight, uh, decisions could have been uh, different which may have uh, saved houses. But uh, the decisions at the time were always based around safety of people of the community um, and of uh, our own firefighters. Rhys Jones says Fire and Emergency New Zealand, a national body established since the fires, has brought together urban and rural firefighters, which means next time there will only be one organisation responding to the fire. He says it accepts the review's findings and has developed an action plan to meet each of the recommendations. But another Worsley's Road resident who lost his home, Kieran Grace, says a new action plan won't bring his home back. Kieran Grace says the review shows systemic failures in the response to the fire and it had been hard to learn that if a different approach was taken, homes may have been saved. Do you feel let down? We feel very let down and despite the um, action plan which Fiends has prepared following the operational review, would be hesitant to trust the response or effectiveness of the fire service, especially if the same management are involved, um, which were in the February fire. In July, the police launched a criminal investigation after the cause of the Marley's Hill fire was found to be suspicious. Now, Fire and Emergency says based on the information available, it's of the view that the Early Valley Road fire is also suspicious. But Rural Fire Manager Richard McNamara says there is insufficient evidence to definitively conclude the cause, so the official finding has been ruled as undetermined, pending new information. I know it's frustrating for people when a bureaucrat stands up and says it's undetermined, but our role is to continue that work in hand in hand with the police to get to the point of truth, and so we're appealing for ongoing help. Mr McNamara says arson is a despicable act, and fire and emergency would be doing everything it could to bring justice to those affected. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Maya Burry. You are with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Thank you for being with us. It's coming up to 28 minutes to six, which is headlines time with Paul Brennan in Wellington. Thank you, John. Māori wardens say they're expecting more trouble in South Auckland tonight ahead of tomorrow night's Rugby League World Cup match between Tonga and Samoa in Hamilton. The Otara Town Centre says it's confiscated more than a dozen weapons from young Tongan and Samoan supporters. The Auckland Council says it might prosecute the owner of a central Auckland multiplex for not having a building warrant of fitness. The council's building control manager says although Sky World is no longer classed as dangerous, its owners have not done enough to earn it a warrant of fitness. The head of the Waikato District Health Board, Bob Simcock, says he will not be resigning over spending at the DHB. The new Health Minister, David Clark, has called for a State Services Commission investigation into the circumstances surrounding allegations of wrongful spending by the former Chief Executive, Nigel Murray, who spent more than $200,000 on expenses during his three years in the job. Mr Simcock says there is no reason for him to resign. Destiny Church has filed an objection to deregistration of its charities instead of filing financial returns. Two people have died in multiple car crashes today, one near Morven, north of Ormaru, and another north of Whangarei. State Highway 1 is closed in both directions at Tofai in Northland and traffic is being diverted. The new government will reconsider the Communities of Learning scheme introduced by the national-led uh, government's Investing in Educational Success initiative launched in 2014. The Education Minister, Chris Hipkins, says he agrees with the goal of encouraging cooperation among education providers, but changes are needed. And the Transport Agency has confirmed that State Highway 1 north of Kaikoura will reopen on December the 15th. It's been closed since last November's earthquake, forcing motorists travelling between Picton and Christchurch to take an inland route that, that, that adds up to three hours to the trip. Those are our headlines. Our next news and sport update will be at six. Which is about 26 minutes away. Thank you very much indeed. Paul, coming up on Checkpoint, between now and six, a stoush brews over the possibility of a Ronald McDonald facility at the rebuilt Dunedin Hospital. Investigators continue to probe the Uzbek immigrant charged with the New York truck attack, trying to establish whether, in fact, he acted alone 
or with help from the inside of the US. We have more on the story of Māori wardens out in South Auckland. We don't often look at sport on Checkpoint, not very often at all. So we're going to preview a really uh, busy old weekend of sport ahead uh, with Clay in the not too distant future. Um, we would love your feedback on any of the subjects that we are covering on Checkpoint tonight. You can text us 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. We are, of course, on Facebook where you can watch us live as you can on Freeview 50 and Face TV, which is Sky. 83 and our email address is checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. However you are joining us, by the way, thank you for being with us. And thank you also for being with Giles Beckford, who is beaming in now on Friday evening from the Wellington Newsroom. Uh, Giles, another New Zealand company has been sold to foreign owners. Indeed, it's one that's well known to us, John. It's Icebreaker, which is the merino wool outdoor garments maker. Uh, they've gone and sold themselves, if you want to call it that way, to a big American-based retail giant. It's quite called VF Corporation. You probably don't know the name, but you will recognise the brands, North Face, Timberland, Lee, Wrangler and Vans, all pretty well-known clothing brands in one market or another. It's a $17 billion a year company. Compare that with Icebreaker, which has sales of around $220 million. So it's David and Goliath. Uh, now, at the, when I first read this, I thought, oh, no, here's another New Zealand company gone over there and they've taken the money and take the big money. But, of course, Jeremy Moon is well known as the founder of that company, well known as having quite a passionate attachment to the outdoors and to safeguarding that New Zealand identity, which he finds quite iconic and has been a good tag for the company as it sold its goods. Uh, so they've uh, said quite clearly that really... Although they may well have found uh, extra money uh, and found investors in New Zealand or elsewhere, and they did tout themselves around, apparently, to other overseas companies, the thing they liked about VF is what it gives them. It gives them the opportunity for new platforms, new markets, new customers, uh, new associations so that they can be sold in association with other brands. Uh, and also, at the same time, they're getting a commitment that the New Zealand identity of Icebreaker will be preserved. I had a chat with Rob Fife, former Air New Zealand chair and also the chair of Icebreaker. He says it was that non-monetary value of the VF offer which really swung the deal for them. That's the important thing. Uh, it seems, once again, though, unfortunately, that we're pretty good at starting companies in yeah. New Zealand and sustaining them, but somehow we just never quite seem to hang on in there and keep them for a great length of time, except in a few exceptional cases. Although Rob Fife, at Rob Fife and Jeremy Moon will continue with the company, so uh, certainly it's not a case of the Americans coming in and just slinging them all out. Yeah, it's a really interesting story, isn't it? Because that was a great start-up. It's been a real success story. Well, yeah, yeah, it's been a success story, hasn't it? And as you say, it's not ours any longer. But I guess that is the way of the modern world. Giles, how did the markets finish the week? Well, the markets have been, uh, they were, it's been a day of two halves for shares. They were positive in the morning. They turned negative in the afternoon. Not too much, though. The top 50 index closing down 18 points, 8,065. The New Zealand dollar just a touch firmer going into the weekend. 69.3 US cents, 90.1 Australian. One little tag for next week. Look out for the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's last statement of the year. Uh, and it will be interesting to see if they give some acknowledgement to the change of government uh, and the somewhat uncertain policies that, and structures that the RBNZ mm -hmm. will have to contend with as it sets interest rates going into the new year. And that, John, is business for another week. We've enjoyed your company this week, Giles Beckford, our business editor. Thank you very much and have a great weekend. Māori wardens in South Auckland fear a fresh wave of violence may erupt between Samoan and Tongan rugby league supporters on the streets of our largest city tonight. The police arrested six people last night after hundreds of Samoan and Tongan league fans gathered in the car parks surrounding the Otara town centre. There's been heightened tension between the two factions with several fights taking place in Otahuhu and Otara this week. Tom Furley with this report. It started about lunchtime. And um, we were starting to see people um, coming to Otara with their flags. By 8 o'clock last night, it was just riotous. Mediana Pekka leads a team of Māori wardens in Otara. She estimates more than 500 Samoan and Tongan supporters converged on the town centre last night. But while the honking and flag waving may have been jubilant at first, Locals say the mood soon turned sour, with many looking for a fight. 
Mr Pecker's team worked overnight to try to keep the crowds calm. We couldn't even get out of the car park uh, because the cars were just bumper to bumper and flags everywhere, people out on the roads. There was a lot of rocking of other cultures and it wasn't, um, wasn't very nice. The police arrested six people during the clash. They are expected to keep a heavy presence there again tonight. Tongan supporter David Saliva says the violence in Ōtara has escalated in the last few days. Just pretty much look at people that's roaming around with flags and follow them and you know as soon as they stop they start throwing punches and bottles and stuff. Mr Saliva says the violence is a waste of time and the fans would be better off showing genuine support for their teams. Rana Judge from the Ōtara Business Association says they have been forced to remove people from the town centre. The customers are scared and, and the business people are scared as well because uh, these people the, um, become in a bigger group. The adults, children, you know, all, all mixture and, and they're noisy and uh, aggressive. Town centre administrator David Vainui says school-aged fans have been using flags from a local $2 shop to conceal objects that can be used as weapons. Two by four wood inside the flag and walking around and trying to hide it away from everybody but we had to take it off them. Mr Vainui estimates he's destroyed about 15 such objects this week. Nearby Sir Edmund Hillary Collegiate has banned students from displaying flags or symbols in a bid to keep things calm. Mariana Pekas says she expects more clashes tonight and it'll be another late one for her Māori wardens. Even after the game it will continue because then we're going to have the team that's going to be celebrating and then the other team that's, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's just um, chaos. It's chaos. The police met with community leaders late last night and say they're using their influence to calm things down. It's hoped this will encourage better behaviour from league fans ahead of the game at Waikato Stadium tomorrow night. From Auckland for Checkpoint, Tom Furley. 18 and a half to six. In investigators are continuing to probe the Uzbek immigrant charged with the New York truck attack, trying to establish whether in fact he acted alone or with help from inside the US. New York police say Safulo Saipov appears to have radicalised himself online before he drove a pickup truck onto a bike lane in Lower Manhattan, killing eight people and wounding more than a dozen others. Federal authorities have now charged the 29-year-old with providing support to a terrorist organisation, saying he was inspired by Islamic State to carry out the rampage. Our CNN's Bryn Jindras has more. Tonight, investigators want to know whether Saifullah Saipov had help in the alleged terror plot. Federal authorities are on the ground in at least four states trying to learn more about the 29-year-old, his past, his associates, and when he may have been radicalized. We'll see as, as we go down the road uh, if he acted alone or, uh, or, if he had, or if he had some help. The details of what Saipov told police exposed in this 10-page charging document where he admits he wanted to kill as many people as possible and showed no remorse. Court papers show Saipov started planning for an attack a year ago, but more recently decided to use a truck because it, quote, would inflict maximum damage. He rented the Home Depot truck last week to practice how it drives, then allegedly picked Halloween night, hoping more people would be on the streets. Saipov told investigators he intended to drive all the way to the Brooklyn Bridge. But that plan was foiled when he crashed into a school bus Tuesday. According to the court papers, Saipov executed the attack in the name of ISIS and was motivated by the group's leader. Quote, after viewing a video in which Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi questioned what Muslims in the U.S. and elsewhere were doing to respond to the killings of Muslims in Iraq. Saipov told investigators he even wanted to hang the terrorist group's flag on the truck, but decided against it because it would have drawn too much attention. And he asked to hang that flag in his hospital room, the complaint says. Inside the rental truck, investigators found knives, a stun gun, and two cell phones. On them, about 90 videos and nearly 3,800 images related to ISIS. Picting, among other things, ISIS fighters killing prisoners by running over them with a tank, beheading them and shooting them in the face. The document shows Saipov admitted to writing a note pledging allegiance to the terrorist group. It ended with, it will endure. Investigators say a direct reference to the Islamic State.
That's CNN's Bryn Gingras, who uh, joined us live on Checkpoint from the scene the other night. It is 16 minutes to 6. A stoush is brewing between public health advocates and Otago's mayors over the possibility of a Ronald McDonald House facility at the rebuilt Dunedin Hospital. Public health advocates argue while there is a need for a place for families to stay when loved ones are being treated, it shouldn't depend on or be associated with a fast food giant. But the region's mayors welcome the idea of having a Ronald McDonald House in the region. Timothy O'Brien reports. The mayors of Clutha, Waitaki and Central Otago districts have called on the Southern District Health Board to get behind a Ronald McDonald House facility at the new hospital. Last month, Ronald McDonald House Charities said Dunedin was one of two cities it had identified as being in need of family facilities. This prompted the Public Health Association's Otago Southland branch to speak out against the idea. Dr Keith Reid, a member of the association, says the debate is being framed as public health advocates knocking back family facilities. However, the association's quibble is with them bearing McDonald's name. The majority of the funding for these facilities is community derived, so that, that funding could be used in a different way, in a different model, to produce a, a similar or a better facility without the corporate branding. It's people have got uh, a bit tramlined into the, th to the thinking of it's Ronald McDonald or nothing. Dr Reid says the association questions the restaurant's reasoning for being involved in the charity. McDonald's has two aims in getting involved in Ronald McDonald House charities. One is the charitable purpose and the other is the corporate benefit that the McDonald's brand derives from their involvement. And that's why the challenge we put to McDonald's as the Public Health Association was support this type of charitable work but without your name associated to it. Um, and of course they've said no. But Clutha Mayor Brian Cadogan has not minced his words in his response to the association's concerns. We get these burger buffoons that come in on their high horse. It's just not on. He says the isolation of his residence means such facilities are essential, regardless of branding. It's a fantastic facility that allows them that wee bit of space in a very insidious time and, and a position of stress for the family, it's a breather for them. And we'll fight for that, man, tooth and nail. Wanaka man, Jason LaRose's son, suffers from a rare metabolic condition, which has resulted in the family being in and out of Ronald McDonald House in Auckland for the past six years. It's been a godsend because we didn't know what we were going to have to do. By that I mean selling houses or shifting or moving. But being able to live there for four months, it saved us. It, it kept us together as a family when we needed to be together. So I, I can't speak highly enough that place. That, that helped us through some really, really dark days. He says he is baffled by the Public Health Association's position. I laughed at it first because I thought clearly they have not talked to families or, or, or been to it. If anybody who's ever gone or been or spoken to families about that would get probably the same feedback you're going to gain from me, which is that place has saved a lot of families. Ronald McDonald House Charities Chief Executive Wayne Hallett says those involved in the debate have got ahead of themselves. He says the charity is fact-finding and has identified Dunedin as a location suitable for a facility, but there is no proposal at present. However, if one was to eventuate, he says it should be supported. There's more than enough um, evidence on a public benefit to, for people to go, actually, Ron McDonald House Charities is nothing about selling burgers. Mr Howlett says no plans will be advanced until the southern DHB is further through the Dunedin Hospital rebuild. DHB Chief Executive Chris Fleming told Checkpoint in a statement the DHB will consider whānau and family facilities for the new hospital. He says clinical leadership and the Community Health Council will provide advice on the matter and how facilities should be funded. In Dunedin, Timothy Brown. It is a big weekend on the way for sports fans here and overseas. The first match of the All Blacks end of year tour against the Barbarians in London. There's the Kiwis in the Rugby League World Cup alongside that huge clash between Tonga and Samoa. And here on our own shores, the penultimate round of Supercars Championship being hosted at Pukekohe Park Raceway. All that without even mentioning the Black Caps in India, the inform breakers. Five consecutive victories, top of the table, the New Zealand Māori rugby side in Canada. Canada and much more. So we whittled it down and we began by asking sports reporter Clay Wilson about the number of New Zealanders we could expect to see take the field at Twickenham, which is in London, of course, tomorrow night. 
I think uh, 13 in the Barbarians. I guess you take the All Blacks. They're all Kiwis. Uh, 13 in the Barbarians, 10 starting. So uh, I guess it's close as you get to a, a, a All Blacks trial in this sort of modern age where you don't get those sort of things like you used to back in uh, your heyday, I guess. Yeah, you cheeky bugger. You're pointing at me and saying I'm old. But you're right. They used to be north versus south when I was a kid. I just I just barely remember them. Yeah, um, you'd stop it, Clay. Yeah. Just behave yourself. <laughs> so... Uh, 15 All Blacks, 15 Kiwis in the All Blacks, and 10 in the starting 15 for the Barbarians. So when that game begins, there will be 25 New Zealanders on the field at Twickenham. Correct, plus the two Kiwis that are coaching the uh, Barbarians, <laughs> Robbie Deans and Scott Robertson. So, yeah, it's a pretty much an all-Kiwi affair in the middle of London. Yeah. yeah. So how many tickets sold? 70,000 tickets. Um, well, they're going to sell it out. They usually do with these games because they're such entertaining games. They're so open, um, such a festival sort of atmosphere with these games that uh, people love to get along. There's going to be lots of points, lots of tries. Both teams are going to play with a lot of flair. So uh, I guess, and they're full of full of exciting players on both sides. So um, I certainly won't be lacking entertainment. So you can see why they, people run and snap up tickets. Yeah, that's yeah. the potency of the New Zealand rugby brand in London. It's extraordinary, isn't it? There's 25 Kiwis on the field and there's 70,000 Brits going along to watch them. Who are the players that we will be looking out for most excitedly, do you think? Yeah, I guess the All Blacks have named something of a second string team, as you might expect for the first match of a tour. Um, there's three guys set to make their debut. They're all coming off the bench. Um, Asafa Omer, of course, one of the great young Hurricane. Well, not even a Hurricane. Just no, still just a, a Wellington player. Still a Wellington line. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we've got Tim Perry from my neck of the woods in Tasman, an upcoming prop. And we've also got Matt Duffy, who, of course, has a great story coming back from league, from Mel the Melbourne Storm, playing for North Harbour. And, you know, he's got a crack at the All Blacks late in life. For people who are listening who aren't rugby fans, Asafa or this kid from Wellington, this number two, have we ever seen a hooker play rugby like him? I mean, I thought Dane Coles redefined the genre, but Asafa goes even further, doesn't he? Mm. Well, probably, uh, probably the wrong pun to use, but he's sort of like Dane Coles on steroids a little yeah. bit. You know, yeah. he's 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 big and he's whereas Dane's a lot sl more slender and he has a bit of pace, but the pace and the power, I don't know where it comes from. He's just translated it straight from his under twenty environment, come straight into the NPC and and just taken it by storm. And of course, in the all legs right now. So yeah, yeah, a yeah, beautiful audacious player. What about Bowden Barrett, a skipper? How do you think he's going to go? Yeah, pretty good. I think it's more of a nominal thing, you know, probably just to, to they didn't have anyone else really to give it to, but um, always been a Bowden Barrett fan. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess from 10 naturally, you're, you're taking a bit of a leadership role anyway, steering the team around. So um, he'll probably fit in quite well. But of course, we all know who the All Black captain is. And, and once, uh, once we go to next weekend, the normal service will re resume and Kieran Reid will come back in. Supercars, book a call here this weekend. Changing sport for people who don't even know what we're talking about. So we are moving from rugby to motor racing. <laughs> bit of a, just a bit of a contrast, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, this is the, the round we have here every every year. It's the penultimate round, and it couldn't be more exciting and, and better set up, I guess, really for Kiwi fans because there's uh, literally about 27 points between the top three, and in the top five we have three Kiwis all in contention. So we've got a... Fabian Coulthard and Scott McLaughlin, both in the same team in second and third. They're just uh, a handful of points behind Jamie Winkup, who's six times the champion, I think, of the of the supercars. And then Shane Van Gisburg, and he's a bit further down the pack in, uh, in uh, fifth, I think. But, you know, still, a, still a, a, a definite chance to come out and win this thing. Um, and I actually caught up with Scott earlier this week, and I sort of said to him, with it all so close, uh, do you think you're, you're probably going to have one eye on your rivals, or do you think it's going to be all out attack just as normal? Yeah, I think you've got to think about what those guys are doing, but I think the best form of attack is, you know, we just, we just push on. And uh, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the, for, for the racing because I think for the fans to have a championship so close, it's, it's, it's almost like it's the start of the year when everyone starts on the same point. So it's exciting to be a part of it, to be one of the three, one of the five that can still fight for the championship. It's cool. But, yeah, I, I think I'll just get on with it and, and have a crack. So that's obviously Scott McLaughlin. He's going to have a crack. Have a crack. Be aggressive. And Shane Van Gisbergen's never one to, uh, to back off, so he's going to be doing the same. Uh, I also caught up with him, and I said, what's it like? Uh, does it ever get old coming back to New Zealand? Yeah, and especially the last four years now, um, being back in Pukekohe, you know, I can stay at home, come home early, and, yeah, just love racing there, you know. That's where my interest in V8 started, was watching the racing there. So now being on the other side of the fence, pretty cool. He's a good boy, isn't he? A good Kiwi boy. He certainly is. Uh, the other thing is that's happening in New Zealand this weekend is the um, Rugby League games. And, of course, so much talk in the news about the uh, Tonga versus Samoa game. Yeah. A lot of stuff off the field. That's going to be a cracker on the field too, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's not often uh, New Zealand are playing test match in New Zealand and that game takes a back seat to yeah. another game between two other nations. But I guess, um, you know, many Samoa, many Tonga are a bit in Auckland here, so 
there's obviously been a lot of publicity about some of the stuff happening. A lot of passion, sometimes spilling over. Um, it just shows how much they love their their rugby league. It's going to be a, that's going to be one uh, one hell of a game. And also, there's there really special things with players who would get a run with the Kiwis, choosing to play for Tonga, for example. So there is a lot of declaratory stuff going on, which is quite exciting given the battles that they have in the Pacific to retain players, right, both in league and rugby. Can we talk about the Kiwis? Who are they playing? Well, they're playing Scotland, and uh, I guess you have to remind some people because people forget about it, and I just, it just shows how, how big this Tonga Samoa game is going to be. Um, I guess you, you expect the Kiwis to sort of run over Scotland. They, they got fairly well hammered by, by Tonga, and the Kiwis were actually reasonably impressive last week against Samoa, despite all this off-field stuff. So um, I think we expect them to sort of go past it. And then, of course, we look forward to the... The huge clash between New Zealand and Tonga, which, uh, as you know, with everything that's been going on, is one a lot of people, players and fans included, are looking forward to. Yeah, that's going to be a cracker of a game. Right, let's make some picks, Clay. Uh, New Zealand, Scotland, that's the Kiwis, isn't it? Yeah, Kiwis by probably 30 points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's generous to the Scots. I think you're a nice young man. <laughs> uh, Tonga Samoa? Oh, the Tongans, they've just got too many stars, I think, across the park with all those players that have come back from New Zealand. So I think it'll be closer than people expect, very physical, but I have Tonga by about 10 points. And Barbarians All Blacks? Yeah, hard to see the All Blacks losing. Uh, high scoring, probably uh, 70 to 80 points, but I have the All Blacks by about 15, I think, probably a bit too much class. And the Bar Barbarians are thrown together, of course, at the last minute, so it's hard to, to gel for 80 minutes when you, when you come into an environment like that. But going to be a cracking game, either way. A cracking game. Julian Sabio playing for the Barbarians, of course. He has a point to prove. That's Clay Wilson, our sports reporter. In Indonesian, the word orangutan means forest man. And scientists who have been puzzling for years over the genetic peculiarity of a tiny population of orangutans in Sumatra have finally concluded that they are, in fact, a brand new forest man a brand new species to science. The apes in question were only discovered during an expedition into the remote Sumatran mountains just 20 years ago. Since then, a research project has unpicked their biological secret. The species has been named the Tapanuli orangutan, a third species along with those already found in Borneo and other parts of Sumatra. This fascinating wildlife story with the BBC's Victoria Gill. The remote mountain forests of Sumatra are home to some of our closest ape relatives. And a small population here, first discovered just 20 years ago, has been hiding a scientific secret. This is the Tapanuli orangutan, a species new to science. Until now, it was thought that they were just two distinct species of orangutan, Sumatran and Borneian. But this new study shows that there are actually three a tiny population has been hidden away and isolated by hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. Early DNA analysis suggested these animals were peculiar compared to the other Sumatran apes. So scientists embarked on a detailed study examining what they ate and their unique calls. This is the orangutan. Years of painstaking genetic comparisons enabled scientists to reconstruct the animal's evolutionary history. The final piece of the puzzle, though, was tiny but consistent differences between the Sumatran and the Tapanuli orangutan skull. It's an amazing breakthrough, I think. There's only seven, if, if we exclude ourselves, of great ape species. So adding one to that very small list is, is spectacular. With just 800 known individuals, this species will go straight onto the critically endangered list. Logging, mining and plans for a hydroelectric dam already pose a threat to its habitat. The hope is that adding this ape to the biology textbooks will help to ensure its survival. That story from Victoria Gill, the BBC. Absolutely beautiful creatures. It's coming up to two minutes to six. Thank you for being with us on Checkpoint. After the six o'clock news, we have the latest from Manus, which is, uh, well, an unpalatable situation, no matter how you look at it or what side you approach it from. What is going up there? The latest from the Catalans. Uh, the Ca well, actually, the Catalans is uh, Otago Southland, isn't it? I think it's the latest from Catalonia. <laughs> somewhat, a somewhat different community. Um, <laughs> slightly different climate, slightly different environment, slightly different food. Other than that, I'm sure they have a great deal in common. And, uh, yeah, 
uh, Donald Trump um, uh, picks a new governor for the Fed, a new um, head of the Fed in the US. What is next there? All of that and more coming up. We're getting lots of feedback tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You can always text us on 2101. You can email us, checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. And we are, of course, on Twitter and Facebook. I know some of you wonder why we bang on so much about Facebook, but the whole point of what we're doing here on Checkpoint, well, not the only point, is to engage with people who haven't been traditional Radio New Zealand RNZ listeners, people who don't even really know what RNZ is. And we are getting to those people some of them for the first time in the history of this organisation through our Facebook feed. Not only are some of them now starting to watch us live, but lots and lots of people are watching our stories back after the fact uh, in their own time later tonight or over the weekend. People who have never listened to Radio New Zealand before in their lives are now getting our content for the first time. And that, we think, is the point of public broadcasting, to get to as many people as we possibly can. Because if you are doing work that is worth doing, and we like to think we are, then the more people who see it or hear it, the better. So when we bang on about Facebook, that is the point of the Facebook exercise. But traditional listeners, we are, of course, delighted to have you with us, and we wouldn't be here without you. And to celebrate all of that, that long monologue, let's listen to the pips. RNZ News at 6 o'clock. Good evening, I'm Paul Brennan. An 85-year-old Dunedin man has been found guilty of more than 20 historic sex charges. Murray Oscar Kanavisha faced trial in the Dunedin District Court this week on 23 charges. Two were dismissed during the trial and jurors have just returned their verdicts on the remaining charges. Two of rape, one of indecent assault, 13 of indecency with a girl between 12 and 16 and five of indecency with a girl under 12. The jury unanimously found Kanavisha guilty on all charges. The charges related to offending between 1963 and 1983 involving six victims, all of whom were children at the time. Kanavisha stood impassively in the dock as the jury returned its verdicts, only briefly hanging and shaking his head. He's been remanded in custody to be sentenced no later than December the 19th. Māori wardens in South Auckland fear there will be another night of violence on the streets tonight. Tensions between rugby league fans before a World Cup game between Samoa and Tonga tomorrow have erupted into violent brawls this week. Six people were arrested last night after 200 Samoan and Tongan league supporters clashed in an Otara car park. Mariana Pekka, who leads a team of Māori wardens in Otara, says she's expecting it to get worse before the big game. I'm having to call my team back in after having a night shift. Um, I'm having to call them back in to go out and patrol. Mm. They're going to be there till late tonight. Mariana Pecker there. The police are expecting to have a strong presence in the area again tonight. Fire and Emergency says it's doing everything it can to bring justice to those affected by the Port Hills fires. Two separate fires, several kilometres apart, started on February the 13th, the first on Early Valley Road and the second on Marley's Hill. In July, the police launched a criminal investigation after the cause of the Marley's Hill fire was found to be suspicious. Now the rural fire manager, Richard McNamara, says based on the information available, the other fire was also suspicious. But he says they can't yet be definitively proved, so the official finding is undetermined pending new information. I know it's frustrating for people when a bureaucrat stands up and says it's undetermined, but our role is to continue that work in hand in hand with the police to get to the point of truth. And so we're appealing for ongoing help. Richard McNamara says uh, um, arson is a despicable act. Republican members of the United States Congress have unveiled plans for America's biggest tax reform in more than 30 years. The proposals include a big drop in the company tax rate, as the BBC's Anthony Zercher reports. Republicans have unveiled their tax reform proposal. It doesn't touch popular tax-deferred retirement plans, the charitable deduction, or the credit for low-income workers. It does drop income tax brackets for all but the wealthiest, increase child tax credits, and reduce the corporate tax rate from 35% to 20%. The changes are estimated to decrease federal revenue by $1.5 trillion over 10 years and will be opposed by Democrats and some key special interest groups. Anthony Zercher in Washington there. A group of prominent former judges in Australia is calling for the creation of a national anti-corruption agency. They say serious corruption almost certainly exists in federal politics but is not being exposed. A former Victorian Supreme Court judge, Stephen Charles, says the need for such an agency is clear. 
I have no doubt at all that um, there is abundant corruption in Canberra. It's already well known that there is abundant corruption in the other capital cities of Australia. Why on earth does the air suddenly clear around Queanbeyan? A former Victorian Supreme Court judge, Stephen Charles. A woman has been killed and two people have been injured in a crash at Tolfai, north of Whangarei. State Highway 1 is closed in both directions and traffic is being diverted. It's the second fatal crash in Northland this week. Three people were killed in multiple collision in a multiple collision at Oakley, south of Whangarei, on Wednesday. And one person is dead after a crash involving four cars near Morven on the Waimati Highway north of Omaru this afternoon. St John Ambulance says another person has serious injuries and two others have minor injuries. And two people, one of them a child, were injured in a crash between a bus and another vehicle in Queenstown this afternoon. Pictures from the scene show a bus with a school sign on the back of it blocking part of Frankton Road. St John says one person has serious injuries and a child has minor injuries. It's coming up to five minutes past six. On to sport now, and Kangaroo star James Maloney has pulled uh, out of, I think it's supposed to be out, uh, of Australia's Rugby League World Cup match against France in Canberra tonight for personal reasons. Melbourne Storm playmaker Cameron Munster is likely to replace him in the halves. Meanwhile, Kiwi second rower Joseph Tapeni has scored, uh, has a score to settle when New Zealand plays Scotland in Christchurch tomorrow. Tipini, who was a standout performer in the Kiwis tournament opener against Samoa, says he still holds a grudge against Scotland over a Four Nations encounter last year that ended in a draw. They've got some magic in their team as well, but, you know, that draw really hurt me last year. It was my debut, so I, I definitely want to go out um, this weekend and go hard and get that win. Joseph Tapini. Meanwhile, the NRL and its players have reached an agreement on pay after more than 16 months of negotiation. The settlement includes a 52% rise for the players, the biggest in the game's 109-year history. Australian driver Cameron Waters has finished fastest on practice day ahead of the Auckland Super Sprint at Pukekohe this weekend. Supercars Championship leader Jamie Wincup was second fastest, while Scott McLaughlin was the best of the New Zealand contingent in fourth. The first of the two races start tomorrow. And Lydia Ko is making her way up the leaderboard as she nears the end of the first round at the latest LPGA tournament in Japan. She's two shots under with three holes to go, four shots behind the leader. That's the news. This week on Music 101. After a five-year hiatus, the Fleet Foxes return to New Zealand in January with a new album, Crack Up. We speak to Psych Rockers Pond about the Australian West Coast's penchant for swapping band members. Tama Waipura is in for the RNZ Music mixtape. And the new Kurt and Courtney, Violin Barnett, that is. Music 101, this Saturday from 1 on RNZ National. I'm all alone on my own by my and there ain't a single another soul around. Now the short forecast from for the weekend, taking us through, in fact, to midnight tomorrow night, Saturday. Northland to Waitomo, including Coromandel Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Rain spreads east this evening. Localised heavy falls to be expected. Taranaki and Tamaranui through to Kapiti, also Taihapi, mostly cloudy, occasional rain or showers. Gisborne to Wairarapa, also Wellington. Cloudy periods, a few showers, mainly about the ranges. Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury. Showers retreating to the Alps and western ranges and becoming mainly fine elsewhere. Buller to Fiordland, periods of rain, heavy at times. Otago and Southland, scattered showers. Isolated thunderstorms are possible. And for the Chatham Islands, fine spells for the rest of today. Mostly cloudy tomorrow, occasional drizzle. It's seven and a half minutes past six o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, Paul Brennan, and thank you everyone for being with us on Checkpoint. The Auckland Council is now considering prosecuting an Auckland building owner after a Checkpoint investigation revealed he's failed to get a warrant of fitness for well over 400 days. James Kwak's Sky World building on Auckland's Queen Street between Aotea Square and the Civic Theatre is a busy entertainment complex that's visited by two million people a year. But it's been plagued by fire safety concerns since 2014. At the start of the year, the building was so dangerous, theoretically, human smoke detectors were used in lieu of a fire alarm system. The council itself says James Quack's been frustrating to deal with, but until today wasn't considering legal action. Here's its building consent manager, Ian McCormick, at a media conference this afternoon. The expectation was, and certainly the undertakings made to my staff, was that uh, at the end of this month, um, that all of those um, 
uh, specified systems would be fully compliant and they would provide evidence to that effect. This is the only building that I'm aware where we've had at the mo in recent times where we've had this sort of level of um, or lack of responsiveness, I suppose, from a, from a building owner. My concerns are how long this, uh, this process has taken. Um, I think it's been a, a very frustrating process uh, for my team. Uh, over a, quite a substantial uh, period of time, we've been dealing with a variety of different uh, IQPs working for the building owner, um, making small um, iterative process uh, improvements, um, promising a lot, um, delivering um, only um, a, a little. So whilst we've continued to make iterative process, uh, it certainly hasn't been fast enough for my liking or the liking of my staff. And, and it, we are still remaining in exactly the same situation today where we had undertakings that um, all the evidence would be provided to us at the end of the month and uh, that um, um, isn't the case. I, I couldn't comment as to the reason for the behaviour, um, but um, it would be fair to say it's, uh, it's frustrating. Um, fortunately, it's not something that we see very often. Um, I must say, I think as a, as a population, uh, building owners in, uh, in Auckland are responsible people who take their um, responsibilities uh, seriously uh, and get on to these sorts of issues uh, with speed. Ian McCormick speaking at a media conference this afternoon. Now, Checkpoint can confirm that event cinemas at Sky World were closed this morning for the morning session and reopened at midday. We are trying to get more information on that, but morning sessions off. New Zealanders say the government should help Manus Island refugees following the closure of the Australian detention camp, but believe Canberra also needs to take some responsibility for the men. The 600 or so asylum seekers within the camp are refusing to leave out of fear they'll be attacked by hostile locals. And they're pleading for the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern to let them into this country, saying she's their last hope. Now, New Zealand has previously offered to take 150 refugees, but that offer was refused as Australia fears refugees would eventually make their way back to Australia as New Zealand citizens. Laura Dooney reports. Australia holds asylum seekers who arrive by boat on PNG's Manus Island and on the Pacific island of Nauru. But Australia withdrew from the Manus Island Centre on Tuesday following a PNG court ruling that the centre was unconstitutional. In Johnsonville, just north of Wellington, most people think Australia should step up and help the asylum seekers most of whom have refugee status, but they aren't sure New Zealand should or could take care of all 600. I think we should do something about it, and I think Australia are being absolute animals. They've got to look after them. They're refugees, for heaven's sake. Maybe New Zealand needs to do, we need to do something about it too. Yeah, I feel sorry for the people on Manus Island, but I don't think we should just randomly take refugees. We should make sure they're properly vetted. And the 650 there, that's a bit more than the 150 that was offered. So how do you choose and who do you choose? Yes, I think they should, we should keep away from them. Um, this country's already cram packed with people who need a lot of treatment and they're not getting it because big queues. Whilst we do take refugees throughout the world, should we take in another 600 just because Australia won't live up to their obligations? I think 150, yes. I don't think 600. I think Australia should own up to their obligations. Those spoken to by RNZ and Nelson felt firmly that New Zealand should show compassion and take them in. I think we should. Honestly, these people have been suffering. They've already moved from a country where their rights have been taken away from them and Australia's taking a hardline policy and I think that we should extend the invite and take them in. If we've got the facilities to actually take them in, duck them into our system, why not? Totally. I think we should take more. We are a country that uh, can handle that easily, you know. We could definitely take more. Our society is quite well equipped with looking after them. Well, I think we should take them. I think we should probably take more as well. We've got the land here. I know we've got a few issues of our own, but uh, it's always good to see ourselves and other people. An online petition created by Peace Action Wellington urging the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern to bring all the refugees to New Zealand has garnered 1,800 signatures. Meanwhile, the situation on Manus Island is becoming dire for the men in the camp after their food, water and electricity was cut off on Tuesday. The Kurdish journalist and refugee Beirouz Bochani says the health of the asylum seekers is getting worse. The people are in a big starvation. There is not any water, food and the tropical mosquitoes. We were struggling with the mosquitoes too. It is a big tragedy. Ms Ardern is meeting with her Australian equivalent Malcolm Turnbull on Sunday 
and says she intends to reaffirm her offer to take 150 asylum seekers held on Manus Island and Nauru, where another detention camp for asylum seekers remains open. For Checkpoint, Laura Dooney. Let's go to Spain now, which uh, is going after the Catalan independence leaders, including the region's ousted president, Charles Puigdemont. He could face extradition proceedings in Belgium after Spanish prosecutors requested an international warrant for his arrest. As well, eight sacked ministers from the regional parliament have been taken into custody to face charges of rebellion and embezzlement. If convicted, they could face up to 30 years in jail, although giving the full sentence would seem a reasonably inflammatory thing to do. Their arrests prompted fury among pro-independent supporters in Barcelona who are claiming the moves are a return to the repression seen under Spain's fascist dictator, General Franco. The ABC's Anne Barker reports. There were extraordinary scenes in Madrid after a High Court judge ordered eight former Catalan ministers be jailed. A convoy of police vans with sirens blaring took them away to the anger of their lawyers, including Jaume Alonso Cuevillas. They could have simply retained their passports, prevented them from leaving the country, he says. A provisional prison term was unwarranted. Only last week, the seven men and two women were in Parliament as the elected government of Catalonia. Now they face charges of rebellion, sedition and misuse of public funds over the recent referendum that favoured independence. In Barcelona, thousands of pro-independence supporters took to the streets, denouncing the Spanish government as the shame of Europe. Bueno, que la justicia española es... Spanish justice is fascist and dictatorial, says this man, Juan Garcia. We never thought this could happen. It's shameful of Europe. It's unbelievable that this is allowed to happen in Europe. This is like Franco. All that's missing are the bullets. I just found out and I'm about to cry, says another man, Sergi Sanchez. I have lots of pent-up rage. I'm disgusted. I never thought the Spanish state would get to this point. They've crossed a definitive line. Spain's national government last week took the unprecedented step of seizing control of Catalonia and sacking the regional government before calling fresh elections for December. Pro-union supporters have applauded the government in Madrid, but independent supporters, including Leila Zestari, say it goes against democracy. It's a scandal, she says. It's a corrupt government which is breaking the law in the name of the law and in the name of democracy. They're doing everything that should not be done in a democracy, which is to have political prisoners, and Europe's allowing it. Catalonia has voted. More than two million people have said we want independence and a republic. The Bobonis never liked us, and we don't like them either. And we don't want a corrupt leader who's doing what he's doing. We want our president, who is Puigdemont. Carles Puigdemont, Catalonia's now ex-president, was also summoned to court but failed to appear. He and four of his ex-cabinet members are in self-imposed exile in Belgium. His lawyer there, Paul Bacart, says he's unaware of any arrest warrant, but he's indicated Puigdemont is ready to turn himself in. We'll put in place everything we can in order to collaborate with the Belgian police, he says. Puigdemont's exile and the detention of eight secessionist leaders could crush Catalonia's independence movement ahead of December's election. And Catalonia's mayor, Ada Colau, has demanded the Spanish government release them. We should never have reached this point, she says. We're facing a judicial nonsense in front of an unprecedented measure in the history of European democracies and in front of a very, very serious political mistake that is pushing us away from the solution. It's pushing us towards the slippery slope of authoritarianism. It's understood the Spanish court may issue an arrest warrant for Carles Puigdemont later today. And Barker reporting from the ABC. I was reading very small font before the six o'clock news and I looked down to see that the Catlins were becoming independent. The Catlins, of course, is that rather magnificent coastline between Otago and South and we are delighted. I'm delighted to report they're staying. <laughs> they're staying. Tremendous news. Quite a few people were hassling me about that. And fair enough too, we're delighted you're still with us, Catlins. And for those of you who've never visited the Catlins, I do highly recommend it. I visited Hone Tufare, Hone Tufare there once. One of the most beautiful shoots I've ever done. Pristine day, the sea and the sky blue. He was in magnificent form and I couldn't have imagined a better place to be in the entire world. 18 and a half minutes past six. Let's go to Washington now. 
uh, which may at some stage try to become in independent in the not too distant future. All things considered, where the Republicans have unveiled long delayed legislation to deliver the sweeping tax cuts promised by Donald Trump and what looks to be a fraught race in Congress to give him his first major legislative victory in almost a year. If passed, it will be the largest overhaul of the US tax system since the 1980s. The measures slashed the corporate tax rates from 35 to 20%. That's from 35 to 20, the corporate tax rate, cut tax rates on individuals and families and kill off some tax breaks. The Democrats are calling it a massive con job on the American people, and even some Republicans are questioning just how the cuts will be funded. CNN's Phil Mattingly has the details. A wide-ranging overhaul of the U.S. tax code. This is in America. This is our opportunity to make tax reform a reality and deliver the most transformational tax cuts in a generation. The top remaining Republican legislative goal of the year, with no shortage, potential roadblocks ahead. You've been blunt throughout. This isn't easy. There's a reason it At hasn't all. been done in 31, 31 years. years. Yeah. Speaker Paul Ryan making a clear-cut guarantee. Can you guarantee that all middle-class taxpayers will see a tax cut? I know what your model is. That's the are, entire but... purpose of this. And touting a targeted approach for U.S. taxpayers. This tax bill gives average family of four uh, about a $1,200 tax cut. Uh, I think that's going to be helping people who are living paycheck to paycheck. So absolutely, I think this is a game changer for our economy. 429 pages, product of weeks of intense negotiations, now public and drawing support from the president. I really believe we'll have it done before Christmas. I consider that to be one of the great Christ Christmas presents. The bill dramatically cuts the corporate and small business tax rates nearly doubles the standard deduction, increases the child tax credit, and collapses the number of individual tax brackets from seven to four. But it's also rife with potential problems. Some Republicans are already staging a mini revolt over a repeal of the state and local tax deduction for income. And powerful interest groups like realtors and home builders vowing to oppose the bill over its lack of new home buying credit and a $500,000 cap on the mortgage interest rate deduction for new home purchases. All as Democrats, many of whom pledged to oppose the bill before it was even released, attacked the proposal for favoring corporate cuts over relief for everyday Americans. Big, wealthy corporations count far more than kids in this bill. But Republicans are holding firm. We're doing it. Hoping to achieve a once-in-a-generation goal. We're going to get this done. Why? Because the American people deserve this. That report from CNN, uh, House Republican Paul Ryan. House Republican Leader Paul Ryan ending it. Lots of feedback in tonight. Let's have a sample of it now. Thank you. We really love hearing from you. Hi, John. In Checkpoint, how is it that when there's been a police chase of a car driver breaking the law on many levels and being a total risk to anyone that in the aftermath the police come in for unrealistic criticism based on the absence of poor or lack of parenting? When this child should have been learning the basics of rights and wrongs, etc., it's just too easy to use police as a scapegoat, says Maria. That is the story we did earlier about Morocco Thai. The solution is easy. No police chases is done in some Aussie states, but an automatic six months jail if you don't stop. Says another listener, thank you. When Victoria, Australia backed off its police pursuit policy, it resulted in a crime wave of armed robberies, drunk drivers who just speared as they would be chased, as they wouldn't be chased, cars were racing each other because they knew they wouldn't be stopped, and a trend of police cars deliberately being rammed because they weren't allowed to chase. It got so bad so quickly that the chase policy soon went back to what it was previously. We looked at this at some depth at about quarter past five tonight. Stuart Nash was the incoming Minister of Police. The current system is discretion. Basically, it is the judgment of the police officers who are at the scene. Stuart Nash says that is the best system because, as people are here are saying, if you preclude chases entirely, then people just do whatever they like and drive off. But if you are gung-ho, if you think you're in a Clint Eastwood movie and it's chases come hell or high water, then there is risk. So Stuart Nash is going to talk to the police about that balancing act, getting discretion right. Lots of feedback coming in on that tonight, and we really appreciate hearing from you. It's 23 minutes past six on Friday night. Some of the world's biggest hitters are in Auckland for the annual international long drive invitational at Remuera Golf Club this Sunday. Long drive invitational is just how far you can whack the ball, really. 16 players from 12 nations will tee off the first hole to try and claim the $14,500 paycheck. And as Matt Chatterton and our excellent camerawoman and editor, Claire Easton Farrelly, found out, there's more to these guys than just very big swings. For the 
average golfer, a drive over 200 metres down the middle of the fairway can be classed a success. But here at the Rimawera Golf Club, these guys are hitting it twice that distance. Traditionally, long drive competitions are held at the local driving range among friends. However, on the professional circuit, it's big business that takes the best right around the world. What may seem like a straightforward approach, hit it as hard as you can, Former world number one and last year's champion here in Auckland, American Maurice Allen, says there's a science to it, and he would know. He's a biochemist. If one of these guys hits a ball a degree off one way or another and it can go 50, 60 yards completely out of bounds versus the average golfer, it moves 5, 10 yards, it doesn't make a difference, it doesn't bother them. So it's just amazing how these guys, the athletic ability, being able to create the speed, create the motions and some of the positions, if you actually look at the swings that these guys have in slow motion and freeze frame them, and you look at the body, whether it be at the top of the back swing or even at impact, you know, most of the guys are, there's nothing on the ground, their feet are completely off the ground. Maurice, whose longest drive is 420 metres, has to take advantage of his knowledge. While most of the guys competing on the world circuit are well over six foot, Maurice hovers closer to five foot eight. I'm quite small. Yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That just happened this morning. I was six six when I got on the plane, and then I turned into this little guy after the end. But, yeah. Southern Hemisphere is buddy messing with. Yeah, you. yeah, it's messing with me a little bit. Maybe I'll get six six when I get back home. Maurice's compatriot Anthony Thomas only took up professional long driving a year ago and is already one of the sport's best, reaching distances of 390 metres this season. He's a man of many talents. He's an airline steward, actor, fitness model, and has even competed in mixed martial arts. He's also pretty handy at doing backflips too. Just don't ask him to have a hit with his driver though. Do you let uh, any of your mates have a hit? None of these guys. None of these guys. You know, they might accidentally, you know, miss hit, maybe break it. Um, I did let my brother hit it after the world championship. After that was over, I let my brother. He's, he'd been itching to hit it for a long time, and he had a blast. So as long as, there's, as, long as I have enough time to replace it, yeah, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you have a swing. No thanks, Anthony. The club is more likely to break me than I it. All jokes aside, these guys take long driving seriously. Englishman Matt Nicole is a professional golfer in his own right, although he spends more time teaching than playing. He does, however, know one of New Zealand's top professionals and long hitters, Ryan Fox. He's out there on the European Tour, doing really well. I mean, fair play to him. He's uh, hits the ball a long way as well. I mean, kind of some of us guys probably a little bit longer, but you know, our short game doesn't quite hold up to his. <laughs> Do you reckon you could take him in a long drive uh, competition? I reckon I'll give it a good go. <laughs> if Fox's career in professional golf doesn't pan out, he could always foot it with these guys on the world circuit. For Checkpoint, Matt Chatterton. Clear Eastern Farrelly, the camera one. We're going to end tonight by going to Dunedin, where an 85-year-old man has just been found guilty of more than 20 historic sex charges. Now, we're just catching up with this. Uh, Murray Oscar Kinewasha faced, Kinewasha faced trial in the Dunedin District Court this week on 23 charges. Two were dismissed during the trial, and jurors have just returned their verdicts on the remaining charges. We're going to go live now to our reporter, Tim Brown, who's been in court. Hi, Tim. Lovely to have you with us for the second time tonight on Checkpoint. What charges was this man found guilty of? Good evening, John. Uh, Murray Kanawisha has been found guilty of a variety of different sex charges dating from 1963 to 1983. 13 of them uh, involve an indecency with a girl between 12 and 16. Five are an indecency with a girl under 12. One of indecent assault and two of rape. Now, one of those rapes occurred while his wife was in hospital giving birth. Right. What was his reaction to the verdicts? He, he stood almost impassively. Um, occasionally, as, as one of the charges would be read out, he would drop his head and, and shake it. Uh, it looked almost in disbelief. But uh, by and large, he just stood in the dock and listened as the verdicts were read out. Thanks, Tim. So can you just uh, remind us what the guilty verdicts were? Two of rape? One Two of, of rape. Yes, yeah, sorry. One of indecent assault, five of indecency with a girl under 12, and 13, many of which were representative of indecency with a girl between 12 and 16. Uh, obviously, these charges are based on the law at the time the offences were committed. Thank you so much. Timothy Brown, uh, Timothy Brown, who was just joining us live from Dunedin, that, those verdicts just in in the Dunedin District Court, 23 charges laid 
uh, overwhelming guilty verdicts uh, on them. The jury unanimously found uh, Kenny Wisher guilty on all counts. It's coming up to 29 minutes past six. Um, just before we end tonight, lots of feedback coming in on, uh, on the availability of government ministers, uh, people who are uh, incoming government ministers joining us regularly, readily and uh, fairly openly on Checkpoint. This is from Tim. Hi. Really promising tone by Mr Nash on the programme tonight. That's Stuart Nash, the incoming police minister. I hope we can enjoy many, many more open and constructive discussions with ministers over the next year. Great developments for this listener, at least. Thank you for your services. Thank you for your feedback, Tim. Yes, going back nine years, we found the same thing, although it wasn't Checkpoint then, but uh, we were all doing similar jobs elsewhere, uh, with the incoming national government. It does tend to be the case that new governments are readily available. We too hope it continues. We too hope that ministers are and remain as available in the future as they are at the moment. And we do agree this is a good development. We hope it lasts and we hope your listenership lasts. Thank you for being with us on behalf of our really hardworking and excellent team. That is Checkpoint for this week. Have a great weekend. We hope to see you or speak to you again Monday at five o'clock. RNZ News headlines at half past six. Destiny Church has filed a written objection to its charities being removed from the charities register for failing to file financial returns. An 85-year-old Dunedin man has been found guilty of more than 20 historic sex charges. Māori wardens are on alert in South Auckland as tension continues before a rugby league match between Samoa and Tonga in Hamilton tomorrow. State Highway 1 is closed at Tōwhai north of Whangarei after a fatal crash. Traffic is being diverted and detours are in place on State Highway 1 north of Omaru after a fatal crash near Morven this afternoon. Those are the headlines. Our next news and weather at 7. Country Life This Week meets a woman who's mad about sheep and eventually found her dream job on a New Zealand farm. You got your dead sheep to put in the hole, that sort of stuff. I was, I was smiling, he was happy. Yes, drink your dead sheep. <laughs> and my boss was like, come on. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I was just happy.